We study the unknown. We study to know more about what's already known. But why do we study what we study? In academic research, we often have to demonstrate clearly and convincingly the scientific relevance of our research. How does it contribute to knowledge? How does it advance our current understanding and the state of our discipline? Why is it important to spend months, even years, researching a highly specific topic? What's in it for us to fully commit to a research topic? Scholars Unbound is a bi-monthly podcast or video series that showcases the voices of scholars who know no boundaries when it comes to the pursuit of knowledge. You will hear insights from their experiences as international scholars and how these influence their research, hoping to inspire future scholars to be fearless, global, and unbound. I'm your host, Dalia Simangan. In episode 12, I reflected on my decision of embarking on a PhD. I hope that was helpful for those of you thinking of doing the same. And if you decide to do a PhD, I hope that this episode will also be helpful in choosing your research topic for your PhD. And if you have chosen a research topic and ready to propose it to prospective supervisors, stay tuned for the next episode because I asked my former supervisors on what makes a good PhD proposal. The relevance of our research has to be spelled out when we write books and journal articles and even opinion editorials, where we can explain the broader potential impact of the outcomes of our research. Research relevance is a requirement of scientific investigations, but in these formal venues where we share our research, we rarely talk about the personal relevance of our research topics. Why do we choose to study what we study? In my conversation with Elizabeth Gamara and Vanessa Bukalil in the previous episode, I learned so much about their personal motivations for choosing their PhD topics. I was reminded of the importance of connecting our research topics with our personal experiences. We choose a PhD or a research topic for several reasons. I'm not here to litigate the weight of our reasons, there's no better or worse reason. It really depends on our personal circumstances. So we also need to respect others' reasons, even though they are different from ours, or those are reasons we won't draw on if we have to decide on them ourselves. Usually, we choose a topic because it's within our supervisor's area of expertise. This is quite common, especially for those who have identified first their PhD supervisor or advisor before specifying their topic. A PhD is essentially a training, so you need to be mentored for years, and the translation of knowledge and skills during that training period from your supervisor to you would be much more meaningful if you share interests. But these interests are not just topics, and they do not have to be very specific. If your supervisor does research on Buddhist philosophy in Japan, for example, then your research topic could be um, Buddhist philosophy in China. Your shared interest could also be in terms of methodology. If you want to conduct life histories for your research, it would greatly benefit you and your research if you receive adequate training for doing such methodology. What's important here is your long-term relationship with your supervisor. As you probably know, a supervisor can make or break your research. So we also have to choose research supervisors as carefully as we choose our research topics. It's also likely that you choose a topic because it involves urgent issues or it has received some attention in academic or public discourses. For example, the urgency of finding solutions to climate change or environmental degradation led to a proliferation of studies relevant to these topics. Another example is linking research topics within the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since last year, there has been an increase in interdisciplinary research on COVID-19. Obviously, because this pandemic is relevant globally and across disciplines and research activities. This show that our research is a reflection of our society. Another reason that can influence how we choose our research topic is the availability of funding. 
This is especially true for those applying for scholarships. Sometimes uh, these scholarships focus on specific topics or advocate a specific issue or policy agenda. Some international scholarships, for example, are targeted at students from less developing economies, and some foundations provide scholarships to students who wish to work on topics related to their mission or objectives. This is also true even after your PhD when you start applying for funding from grant-providing agencies or foundations. At times, you need to tailor your research topic to be considered eligible for applying to these grants. I decided to do my PhD research on peace building after I was introduced to the concepts of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect or R2P when I was doing my master's. If you are not familiar with the R2P, it was a document agreed upon by United Nations member states in 2005 when they committed to taking the responsibility of protecting citizens from massive human rights violations when the government of those citizens is unwilling or unable to do so. I was really intrigued by the controversy and the debates surrounding such commitment. I was thinking at that time, who could be against saving people's lives? Then I realized that there's so much complexity involved in doing that. And so I did my master's thesis on the political, ethical, and legal dilemmas of humanitarian intervention through the R2P. But protecting lives is just one pillar of the R2P. The other one is rebuilding after the intervention. Rebuilding, of course, is not straightforward. It entails complex issues, and this rebuilding process mainly requires peacebuilding. In my PhD research, I wanted to understand how local involvement factors in in international peacebuilding missions. Initially, my PhD research was mainly based on the literature on the R2P, but later it evolved to a research that engages more closely with the literature on peacebuilding. The reason for such a change was a combination of many factors. Because of some institutional change within my university, I had to change my supervisory panel. And along the way, I had a difficulty finding the connection between R2P and what I wanted to investigate. Thankfully, my supervisors are experts on peacebuilding and on the R2P. And it somehow dawned on me, and again, thanks to the advice of my supervisory panel, that my PhD topic was more aligned with the academic discussion on peacebuilding than on the R2P. These are just some of the reasons why we choose or decide on a research topic that I can think of right now. I'm sure there are more reasons, geographical location, prestige, a PhD program, collegiality of the department or program where you're going to do your PhD, and many other personal and professional reasons. It can also be a combination of all or some of these. But what I think is somehow left at the margins of conversations about research relevance, at least not often found in the academic papers we write, other than maybe in the acknowledgement section, is our personal connections with our research. Elizabeth in the previous episode told us that she has a migrant background and her research is about the securitization of migration. Vanessa also in the previous episode has directly and indirectly experienced conflict. So now she's doing research on conflict resolution. These are more than motivations, I would say. They are also the personal relevance of research. You may choose your topic not only because it's important to academia, but perhaps more so is because it's important to you, personally. I want to make a case at this point why personal relevance matters in choosing a research topic. First, if a topic is personally important to you, you're likely to be more invested in it. Invested in the sense that you are motivated to do it, to complete it, to find out the outcomes, because the outcomes matter to you. You will likely invest time and effort despite shortcomings and challenges. For a project that takes years to complete, such as that of a PhD, being personally invested in your topic will encourage you to reach the finish line. 
To be invested is to be enthusiastic, or for the lack of a better word, to be passionate. A note of caution though, don't let the system take advantage of your passion, which has to be recognized and rewarded first and foremost. Some might say that passion is overrated, but I think it's what keeps us sane from the disillusionment that may come with the realization that many aspects of academia are profit-oriented, prefer quantity over quality, and incentivize number of publications over knowledge creation. The second reason why personal relevance matters is that it allows you to have access to more resources, both material and non-material resources, that would otherwise not be easily available to you. In my PhD research, I studied Cambodia, Kosovo, and Timor-Leste, and unfortunately for me, I don't speak their local languages. That was a main challenge for me. And I believe I would have had more meaningful conversations if I knew the language. Personal relevance will also allow you to access field research sites much more easily. For example, traveling to places with high risks, especially for outsiders, will be challenging, first in terms of safety and also in terms of obtaining data. And even once you have the data, your personal connection, may it be through your lived experience or acquired skills, will equip you with the right tools to judge and analyze your data. Personal relevance of a research, therefore, is not just for subjective reasons, it's also for objective and pragmatic purposes. The final point I want to make is that personal relevance paves the path for continuity. Because you are personally invested in it and have access to more resources, it will again be much easier to continue working along the same line of research. I'm not saying that you have to be limited by what you have done before or you should not diversify your research area. You might have to drop a research topic or a research agenda along the way for some reasons, maybe for the lack of what I have mentioned earlier. Or you might have added some new research topics as you navigate the literature, or as you grow in your field, or because you are in the process of seeking the meaning behind what you do. Personal relevance provides continuity to build on your past research activities. It guides the growth of our research and our growth as researchers. It also links us to what we do, that we are doing our research not only because we are told to do so, or because we need more publications, or because we need funding, but also because it's important to us, it matters to us, to our community, or to values we hold dear. At one point in your academic career, you might face the dreaded existential question and ask yourself, what's the point of my research? I hope that you will be able to remind yourself why you chose to study what you study and remind yourself that your research is personally important to you. I believe that your research is already scientifically relevant or socially relevant, benefiting your discipline, your community, and our society. Informed by this broader and even altruistic drivers of doing your research, your research can also be personally relevant to you, benefiting you, because in the end, it has to be worth it for you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please consider leaving a comment or rating at iTunes or any of your preferred podcast hosting platforms. For details about upcoming episodes and how to support the Scholars Unbound project, visit daliasimangan.com slash scholarsunbound with the link in our show notes.